Well, good morning, everyone. A uh, really warm welcome to our service this morning. We're so glad that you could uh, come and join us here at Millbrook Church of the Nazarene, whether you're here in person. It's great to see so many people out or, or, or online, of course. Uh, we're going to begin our service this morning with uh, some worship, and we'd love you to stand with us as we sing together uh, great things. Worship our King, and come let us bow at His feet, He has done great things. See what our Savior has done, see how His love overcomes, He has done great things, He has done great things. Father, Lord, we just thank you for this, your day. Lord, we just thank you that we can come today and freely worship you, Lord. And we just thank you for your 
presence that's already here this morning amongst us as we as we've been worshiping. Lord, we just pray this morning that as we uh, hear from your word today, Lord, that we will be encouraged. Lord, help us as we as we continue our journey to grace, Lord, that you will uh, speak to us, Lord. Help us to have open hearts and open ears to hear from you, Lord, and speak to me as well as each person that's here and will hear this morning. Lord, we just pray for those in our congregation, Lord, that need, uh, Lord, need a touch from you, whether that's a, a healing touch, Lord, or a touch of comfort, or Lord, just a touch of reassurance, Lord, we just pray that you'll be all that they need you to be to them this morning. And Lord, we pray for all that goes on this morning, Lord, in the service and our Sunday school, and Lord, that you'll be a part of it, Lord, and help us just to, uh, to feel your presence with us. We ask now all these things in your name's sake, we pray. Amen. So again, you're very welcome to your service uh, this morning. I'm just going to bring a few announcements to you uh, for the week ahead. Um, a couple of things to be aware of. So our prayer meeting that we've been having each week uh, is now, we're now moving the first, uh, the first week of each month to an in-person prayer meeting. So that starts this week, this Wednesday at 8 p.m. in the hall. Uh, we're going to have an in-person prayer meeting. And then uh, the following weeks, subsequent weeks, will be uh, still on the Zoom. And then we'll, we'll come back uh, at the start of November and have one in the hall again. So that's good news. We're able to meet in person again, so we're excited about that. Um, we have a, the men's event, which we've been announcing for the last few weeks, is on this Thursday night. It's also at 8 o'clock here in the hall. Um, and we're having a bit of a games night, and the Reverend Philip McAllister is going to be speaking at the end of it just to share a few thoughts. So uh, it'd be great to have a, a turnout for that uh, to support that event. Um, and that's going to be this Thursday at 8 o'clock, so uh, remember that. Uh, for the ladies then, on the 21st of October, uh, there's an event on for uh, pottery painting, uh, Auntie P's pottery painting, at half past seven uh, on the 21st of October. So uh, if you'd like to come along to that, you'd be very welcome, uh, the ladies would. Uh, and it's a uh, £10 deposit to Emma McLean or Sharon McGookin, um, or speak to Pastor Ruth or Victoria. And look, we don't want the, the cost of this event to, to be a, a barrier to anybody coming. So if, there's, if that's an issue, just please speak to Ruth or Victoria. But um, otherwise, the 21st of October, uh, the pottery painting, uh, Andy Pease. So I think I've said that right this week. <laughs> so, um, and then we have Sunday school, which is back on, which is great. And uh, they'll, they'll invite them to leave during the singing of our, our next song uh, for Sunday school. So uh, we'll stand as we sing our, our next couple of songs before uh, Pastor Ruth comes to bring the word. Uh, let's stand together as we sing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. The prodigal is welcomed home, the sinner now is saved. For the God who died came back to life, and everything has changed. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Oh, death, where your sting, oh fear, where is your power? The mighty King of kings has disarmed you, delivered and redeemed. Eternal life is ours, oh praise His name forever. Hallelujah! Christ is risen.
And on the day you call me in to heaven's sweet embrace, I see your scars, your open arms, the beauty of your face. Through tears of joy I lift my voice in everlasting praise. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. your sting, oh fear, where is your power? The mighty King of kings has disarmed you, delivered and redeemed, eternal life is ours, oh praise His name forever, hallelujah, Christ is risen. I see your scars, your open arms, the beauty of your face. Through tears of joy, I lift my voice in everlasting praise. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. In the darkness we were waiting, without hope and without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes, to fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the word, from the throne of endless glory, to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. To reveal the kingdom come and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation, you did not despise the cross. And for even in your suffering, you saw to the other side, knowing this was our salvation, Jesus for us.
its breath to let stones move for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who come to the father are Thank you. Good morning. It's like old times, isn't it, when all the children are here and go out to Sunday school? wonderful it's wonderful to see it we're just going to pray before we come to God's word and we are mindful today that uh, Dwight had surgery on Friday and we'll just be praying for his recovery uh, and that he would know the presence of God Rose phoned me on Friday night and said that the surgery had went well and that he was recovering so we just pray that God would continue that good work in his life father we thank you we thank you that you are above all. Lord, we thank you for the beauty of the words that we have been singing. You have conquered death. You have restored us. You have been to us all that we need. You find us lost and alone. You have given us purpose. You have forgiven us. Lord, you have given us life abundant. We thank you for the salvation for the grace, that saving grace that you bring us. Father, we thank you that you are God above all. And because of that, we can come to you in every situation. Lord, we can come to you to rejoice and give you all the praise and all the glory. We can come to you when we are feeling weak, for we know in you we find our strength. We can come to you, Lord, when we are feeling alone, for you bring us into the community and adopt us into your family, the family of God. Lord, we thank you that you bring your healing power to those in need. Lord, we pray today, especially for Dwight and for Rose and for the whole family, that they would just know your presence with them. Lord, we pray for Dwight as he recovers, that you would be with him in the hospital and as he comes home, Lord, that you would just be with him, that you would strengthen him in body and spirit and be to him all that he needs. And now, Lord, as we come to your word, we pray, Lord, that you would just close us in so that we can hear from you. We pray, Lord, that we would be changed and restored, reconciled, convicted, Lord, whatever it is. Lord, we pray that we would be challenged by your word today. Lord, we give you permission to speak to us. 
I give you permission to speak to me, Lord. I want you to speak into my heart. Lord, we want you to speak into our hearts today. And as you speak, Lord, may we hear and may we be obedient to whatever it is you have to say to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. From the very beginning, right from the beginning in Genesis, when Adam and Eve sinned, there had to be a solution. And the solution was always this. If you think way back into the Garden of Eden, the solution was always, always a sacrifice. Even from the moment that Adam and Eve sinned and God came into the garden and he said, Adam, where are you? And they come out in their fig leaf outfit. And God said to them, what are you doing? And they said, we, we realized that we were naked and we were ashamed because they had sinned. They, they realized that they were naked. And, and do you remember God's response to that? God's response was to sacrifice an animal and make them an outfit of animal, animal skin to cover their sin and their shame. From the very beginning, there was a sacrifice from the very moment that Adam and Eve got it wrong. There was a sacrifice and the shedding of blood. When it comes to the law of Moses, we see it all the time whenever they're building the temple, whether it is the, the, the temple of the tabernacle that followed with them in the tent. There are, there are intricate details of how to make a sacrifice. Sacrifice for sin. Sacrifice for the sin of the people. Sacrifice for the high priest. All of the things. We see it throughout the whole Torah that there is this idea that where there is sin, sin requires forgiveness. Forgiveness is incomplete without sacrifice. The problem, of course, was this. It was a temporary solution. People always sinned. Sacrifice was always necessary. It was a temporary solution. And what was needed was something permanent, something perfect, something that would sort sin out once and for all. And that's where we get to our reading today. We're going to look at Romans chapter 5. If you have your Bibles or your iPads, you can flick or click or your phones. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 to 11 where we see God's solution to sin. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God, he showed his great love for for sending us Jesus Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. Since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. And we pray that God would bless the reading of his word. We know it. We know that Jesus became this perfect solution to sin. And last week we looked at prevenient grace, that grace where God followed us through every moment of our life. And sometimes we may not want to recognize that. Sometimes we want to deny that. But the truth is that God has loved us and has known us from our mother's womb and has followed us and pursued us with grace the whole way along. And today, today we want to look at saving grace. So last week we looked at prevenient grace. Today we're going to look at saving grace or salvation grace. The problem is this, if we want to look at grace, we've got to look a little bit at sin. Now, I know that we're all a bit uncomfortable when we look at sin, and I know that nobody in Millbrook ever sins. I understand that, but sometimes I get it wrong, and I'm just confessing that maybe I'm not that unique. But if we want to look at salvation, Grace, we need to look a little bit at sin. Now, to make it comfortable for you and for me to talk about sin, you know that I like to think about sin in the idea of the frogs. 
and some of you have heard this before. I think it's, when I think of sin, you know, I think of the plagues in Egypt and how God filled Egypt with frogs and it reminds me of sin and it reminds me of some of the frogs that I've met in my own life and I want to explain it just so that we're all comfortable when I'm talking about frogs, we're talking about sin. My very first job was in Belfast. It was an eye-opener for me. I met lots of really unique people who told me great things about their life. There was one woman in particular who was great at telling us stories. Things, if something was going to happen, it was going to happen to her. And I just loved working with her. I loved it whenever she was on the same shift as I was. And we would just have a great day's crack as we went through our work. And one day she told me this story about her sister-in-law. Now, I understand where her sister-in-law was coming from because we're both afflicted with the same problem, thick calves. And and the problem was this, that her sister-in-law really wanted a pair of knee-high brown suede boots. Now, I understand that because when you go into shops and you try a pair of knee-high boots on, sometimes they just don't get past my ankle. And and she had these thick calves and it was really hard for her to find these pair of knee-high brown suede boots and she dreamed about them. She thought about them. She talked about them all the time until suddenly my friend Eileen gets this phone call and it's her sister-in-law. You're never going to believe this. I got a pair of of brown boots. They're suede. They're knee-high. They're fabulous. They're just what I've been looking for. They are brilliant. And one day they're out walking the dogs and I don't know, I don't have a dog, but it seems to be that people walk dogs, carry sticks, I'm not sure why, but they were out walking in Belfast and I think they were going along the side of the waterworks, you know, at the park there. And Eileen and her sister were out walking and her sister-in-law had these knee-high brown suede boots and she went on and on and on about them. Do you think these make my legs look thin? Now, I'm familiar with those sayings. Do you think that I have been waiting for these for ages, but look at them, look at them, aren't they fabulous? And I got them in the sale, and they're just the right fit. They've all been too tight from him. But you see, these ones, these ones are perfect, and she's walking along the road with the dog, with these beautiful, brown, knee-high suede boots on, when all of a sudden, from the railings in the park, out jumps a frog which attaches itself to her brown, knee-high suede boots. Now, she has a stick with her. Now, many people, I just want to tell you at the beginning that I am not responsible for any of the animals in these stories. One of them was harmed. Now, anybody with a stick in their hand might thought you would flick that frog off, but not Eileen's sister-in-law. She just starts to hit it. And she hits it, and she hits it, and she hits it, and she's screaming, and Eileen's screaming, and her sister-in-law's screaming, and you know what happens. This frog is just splattered blood and guts all over these brown suede boots and the boots that she had been longing for, planning for, waiting for, loving wearing were absolutely destroyed by this frog. That frog ruined everything. That's what sin does. It just ruined everything. God had this beautiful, perfect relationship with his creation, with Adam and Eve, and and, and it was perfect and good and it was lovely, but sin ruined it. Just like the frog ruined the boots, so sin has ruined everything for us too. It has caused rebellion against God and against each other. It's broken relationship. It, it, It relationships, it enslaves us to it, it holds us captive, it corrupts everything and it isolates and it alienates. And you're maybe thinking, all right, Ruth, calm down. But here is the thing, there was a man called John Owens who was a 17th century preacher. Do you know what he said about sin? He said, he who thinks sin is slight has never seen that God is great this huge problem, but God intervenes from the very beginning, from that moment that he made that sheepskin outfit. God intervenes. God wants to solve sin until that moment when Jesus dies on the cross and God solves it completely. 
when we think about sin, when we think about all the things that it does, that it corrupts everything and ruins and spoils, is it any wonder that we needed a solution? Is it any wonder that we needed God's saving salvation grace? Sometimes. Sometimes when we think of that work that Christ did, when we think of that work on the cross where he gave his life for us and we find that forgiveness, we think of this transaction that takes place. And and that happens. There is a transactional theology in there. There is a transaction that takes place that God puts Jesus in our place and he takes on our sin. So for sin, we find forgiveness. We owe this huge debt because of sin. And on the cross, we see this debt is paid. So we see a debt and we see a payment. We see that we have been lost and we are journeying the wrong way. And all of a sudden, we have a destination. So our our end journey changes and we are now heaven bound. And we see this transaction take place in the cross. And all of that happens. And all of that is amazing. And all of it is wonderful. But the truth is this. It's so much more. What Jesus did in the cross was so much more. And we sang a little bit about that today, about this restoring, beautiful grace that God brings into our lives. It's more, so much more than a transaction. John chapter 4. John chapter 4, we see the woman at the well, and the disciples have gone off in another direction, and there is Jesus at the well, and here is this woman enslaved to sin. Sin hasn't just held her back. Sin has alienated her. She goes at noon. Nobody goes for water at noon. It's far too hot. Nobody goes to the well at noon. She's there because she has been alienated from the rest of the town. I'm sure as she walks by, the curtains twitch and the elbows move. There she is. There she is. And the gossips in the town, well, they had a field day with her for there's so much to gossip about. She was alienated because of her lifestyle. But you know what else? And I've maybe never thought about this before. She was captive to it. Because whenever Jesus says to her, do you want to go and get your husband? And she said, I have no husband. And she said, and he says to her, I know, because you've actually had five, and the one that you're living with now is not even your husband. She is captive to a cycle that she cannot break out of. And I don't know what led her in her life to be in that cycle, but husband after husband, and then a new person in the scene now, she is captive to that. She does not have the, the power or the, or the resources to get out of that lifestyle. She is captive. So not only has sin alienated her from the whole of society, it is holding her captive. And she meets with Jesus and that beautiful transaction takes place. Her sins are forgiven. Her debt is paid. She was lost and now she's found. But there is so much more. And I want you to listen to the so much more because actually if we have been forgiven by Jesus and and we know that our sins are forgiven, that our debt is paid, and that is absolutely amazing news. But you know what? There is so much more because he's given us life but not just life, abundant life. And I actually believe that we should be living in this so much more. Jesus tells her the story that I can give you water and you'll never thirst again. And she asks him lots of questions. He shouldn't have even been talking to her because she was a Samaritan woman. But this conversation takes place at the well and she is overwhelmed and she finds forgiveness in Christ. Then do you know what she does? She goes into the town and she gets everybody she can find. This woman who was alienated, this woman who turned up at noon, this woman that nobody wanted to speak to, all of a sudden goes into the town and the people who didn't want to speak to her see that there's something has changed in their life. And she just goes up and she says, come and see the man who told me everything about myself. And you know what happens? And this is something I had never thought about before. They, they come. 
The person who was alienated, the one that nobody wanted to speak to, the one that nobody wanted to sit beside at the bus stop, the one that nobody wanted to journey down the town with to collect water, the person that nobody wanted to be with, all of a sudden because of this moment with Jesus, everybody says, okay. Do you know what? There was more than forgiveness of sin took place here. There was an absolute abolishment of alienation and isolation. Now, you can be pleased about that under your masks because that is something amazing that has happened. God not just forgave her, but he restored her. And you know what? If that's what happened to the woman in the well, that's what's happened to us. Not only have we been forgiven, not only is eternity secured, but we have been taken out of alienation and isolation, and we have been restored. Amen. We have been restored. This is good news. Do you know what else happens? (laughs) Just in case you were wondering, but that was just a one-off. Whenever this woman goes to the town and she says to the people, you need to come. You need to come and speak to this man who's told me all about myself the whole time. Well, more or less the whole time turns up. That alienation and isolation is taken away. But after they find Jesus, do you know what happens? They go back and find the woman at the well. Did you read that part? You need to read the whole story because they go back to the woman who was at the well and here's what they say to her. We've got it. We believe, not just because you have told us, but because we have met with Jesus. So not only did she go into the town and be accepted, but then the town came to find, to find her and community is restored because do you know what? When forgiveness comes, restoration comes, isolation is like the window, alienation is, is no longer your problem because we are restored but also we are commissioned. And that too happens in that saving grace. We are commissioned to go into the town and say, look at the difference Jesus has made in my life. If anybody was a poster boy for sin, it had to be Zacchaeus, didn't it? If anybody had got it wrong, it was Zacchaeus. Everybody hated him. They hated him because he had chosen to live that life of sin and do it. Then everybody knew about it. It wasn't secret. He'd get into the position where money ruled his life, greed and corruption and abuse of the, of the poor. Now, do you remember the last time we looked at Zacchaeus? I'm sure you remember all my preaching. But the last time we looked at Zacchaeus, we realized that tax collectors weren't just tax collectors. They were actually money lenders as well. So they would say, you owe this, this amount of tax. And they'd say, I can't pay it. And they would say, well, look, I'm going to lend that to you. So they become lenders loan sharks and tax collectors, they were full of greed and corruption and sin. I imagine that Zacchaeus had got himself into a situation that he was just absolutely trapped in. How how was he ever going to get out of this? He was hated. And he knew he was hated. And because he was hated, he tried to hide. Anybody else would have tried to get to the front of the queue If they were small and couldn't see Jesus, Zacchaeus hid out in a tree. He was hated and he was hidden. He was isolated and he was alienated. And when Jesus passed by, if it had been anybody else, they would never have noticed him because he was hanging out in the tree. And Jesus' saving grace comes in. And Zacchaeus is absolutely forgiven for what he has done. But you know what? In the presence of Jesus, something else happened. Zacchaeus realized he got it wrong. And that saving grace also brings conviction. That part where we get a little bit uncomfortable when we know we've done something that we shouldn't do. And that saving grace of God also brings conviction. Conviction is what leads to forgiveness. Conviction is from the Holy Spirit. But you know what's not? Shame. Shame is not from God. 
Conviction leads to forgiveness so that we can be free from our sin. Shame is a, a tool of the enemy to hold us back so that we can't move forward and that we don't live that abundant life that Jesus came to give us. Conviction is grace. Shame is not. And if you're living in the shame of the frogs that are in your life that Jesus has already forgiven, then you need to know that you have been set free. So there's the conviction, there's the forgiveness. But do you know what else that comes with the case? And I love this part there is the restoration. Whenever he is forgiven and he's realized that he's got it wrong, he said, I've got to put it right now. There is a putting right in forgiveness. And Zacchaeus says to Jesus, if I have taken away money from anybody, I'm going to pay it back fourfold. And do you know what I love about this part? That man who was hidden in that house, and I just imagine him sitting in there every day counting his money, wondering how he's going to get more. All of a sudden, that man who was in his house or hiding out in a tree goes out in broad daylight unashamed unashamed because here is a story of restoration it, you see you over there I know that I took 10 pounds when actually you only owed five and I'm going to give you I was going to count that by four but I'm not going to but I'm, I'm going to give you four times as much 20 I'm going to give you four times as much back there is restoration that takes place in the life of Zacchaeus but you know what you see, when Jesus comes into our life, there's restoration takes, life, takes place in the life of the community that we're in. And all these people that Zacchaeus owed money to that shouldn't really have ever owed money to, all of a sudden they're set free. There is a freedom that comes in the forgiveness of God. There is a liberation that comes in our lives. So if we're still held captive by the frogs, then we haven't fully understood the saving grace that Jesus brings. For we are free. So Case, so Case goes into the community and he forgives the debts of what people owed him. And he pays back what he had taken. Forgiveness and saving grace should affect the world around us. We have the story of hope. It's not just meant to affect us. The same as the woman at the well goes out into the town and says, come and see, it comes with this commission. But actually the forgiving grace of God, it comes with a responsibility too. That we need to be looking at social justice, that we need to be looking at things that need to be made right because God frees and restores. And Zacchaeus had to go and put some of those things right. I don't think Zacchaeus is really that unique. I think that people in the Bible are there to help us to understand the grace of God. I think that we need to be active in the world at putting things right because God has put things right in us. So we have this salvation grace that God brings, but here's the really amazing thing. I don't know if you remember from the start of the story, if you've ever sang the song at Sunday school, when Jesus says to Zacchaeus, come down from the tree, because I'm going to your house for tea. Because I'm going to your house for tea, for tea. Because I'm going to your house for tea. That's the song finished. That's really significant really significant because Jesus brings all these things through his sacrifice. He brings this forgiveness. He brings liberation. He brings the end of alienation and isolation. He brings community. He brings, rec he brings reconciliation. But do you know what happened when he had a meal with Zacchaeus? Do you know what it meant to have a meal in the first century? You invite somebody into your house. You have a meal with them. Do you know what it means? It means we're family. You come into my house and eat with me. We are family. That's why everybody was so appalled. How could Jesus go to Zacchaeus' house? How could he associate with him? But Jesus says when he eats with, with Zacchaeus, we are family. It's not only forgiveness. It's not only reconciliation. It's not only paying our debts. It's not only securing our future as if that isn't enough. But we are adopted and accepted into the family of God. And I can see that I'm excited, and maybe some of you are too. This is amazing grace. That's maybe why they wrote the song. It is 
his amazing, saving grace so much more than just forgiveness. I'm on holiday with Graham and Andrew, and uh, it's been a long time since anybody's been on holiday. I appreciate that. Some years ago, Andrew was still quite young, and we went to America. I said to Graham, would you please take me to that restaurant? It was called the Toothsome Candy Emporium. It specialized in desserts. I don't know why I wanted to go there. <laughs> We had a two-hour wait for a table. They said, if you sit outside in the marquee, you can, you, can, you can be seated in an hour. I said, we'll go for that. I don't care where I sit. Just bring the desserts. That's what I was thinking. So we eventually, we waited and we waited. And we, we, our waiter, Jimmy, showed us to a table. And you could watch the people inside making the desserts. And they had all sorts of chocolate designs and different things. And, and Andrew says to me, Mom, there's a wee frog. <laughs> and I thought it was a chocolate one. I thought it was a chocolate frog stuck to the window as part of the decoration. And I go over to it, and there it is. You know the way their throats go. And I calls Jimmy over. And I said, Jimmy, there's a frog on the window at our table. So it's here, and I'm here. And he said, yes, ma'am, there is. <laughs> and I said, Jimmy, it's me or the frog. <laughs> Turns out Jimmy was more afraid of the frog than I was. So he gets this paper napkin and he goes over to the window like this. And he tries to catch the frog. And the frog jumps from the window into the person in front of me, into their table, into her handbag. <laughs> so now she is screaming. I'm screaming by this stage. I'm on top of the chair. Everybody in the restaurant in this marquee area is turning around to see what happens. Jimmy goes to her handbag, tries to open it. The, jo the frog jumps to the next table and the next table night. The whole restaurant is screaming. The waiters are laughing. I'm laughing to the tears are running down my legs. And then Andrew is absolutely appalled and Graham is laughing and the waiter is going. He's trying to catch it. It goes from one table and then it lands on somebody's hair. She starts to scream, then it goes to the other side of the restaurant. Then this woman just gets up and looks at me and rolls her eyes as if, oh, for goodness sake. She lifts the frog and puts it down by the river outside the restaurant. Here's the thing. Inside, the waiters were collecting the food. Inside, the chef was in the kitchen using the same ingredients, the same seasoning, making the meal just the same way, ready for me to eat. The frog would not have changed the flavor of the food. It just changed how I would have enjoyed the meal. Sometimes, when we have been forgiven, when we are Christians, when we are living for Jesus, the frogs slip in. And we think that God stops loving us. That chef never changed one ingredient, not one, because there was a frog in the marquee. That meal did not change because there was a frog in the marquee. It was my enjoyment changed because there was a frog in the marquee. God does not stop loving us when we get it wrong. That's not an excuse to do it wrong all the time. That's not an excuse to live our lives whatever way we want. But the problem is this, that sometimes when there are frogs in our life, sometimes when sin is present, we use it as an excuse to stay away from God. We say, well, I can't pray today because I know that this is here. This frog's in the living room and, and I haven't dealt with that yet. And once I dealt with that, I, I'm going to go back to God or, or God's not going to want to speak to me because of this. Or, and and we, we get further and further and further away from enjoying that relationship that God has set out for us. And sometimes even when the frogs are sorted, <laughs> we still live in the fear of them when God has taken away our shame and set us free, when he has given us a life that is liberated, a life of freedom, a life of reconciliation, a life of restoration. We need to learn to live in the so much more. We have been forgiven, yes. Who can take it in?
who can take in the greatness of God that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But we also live a life of freedom, not a life of shame. There is so much more in saving grace than just forgiving of sins as if that wasn't enough. But there is life abundant. There is life set free. There is life restored. There is reconciliation. There is removal of alienation and a bringing into community. There is being lost and alone to be adopted and accepted into the family of God. It is so much more. People of God, sometimes the frogs hop in a night. But we need to live in this so much more. Not in the shame, not in the past, not where God find us, but where he wants us to be. In that releasing, restoring, joy giving, fullness of salvation, the grace of Jesus Christ, amazing, saving grace. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you love us so much that you gave your son for us. Lord, we thank you that you took away our sin. We thank you, Lord, that you paid our debt. Lord, how could we ever thank you enough for all that you've done? But Lord, we thank you that it didn't stop there. You have brought freedom. Your grace extends to bring us joy to release us, Lord, to set the captive free, to bring restoration and reconciliation for us to be effective in our community. It brings a commissioning, Lord. It brings an eye-opening to what is going on around us. Lord, it brings us hope and joy and eternal life. We are a grateful people for all that you've done. Thank you, Lord for your saving grace. Amen. Uh, Let's stand together as we sing our closing song. Thanks. I can see the promised land. Oh, there's pain within the plan. There is victory in the end. Love is my path. Cry when my fears like Jericho build the walls around my soul when my heart is overthrown. Your love is my battle cry, the anthem for all my life. Every giant will fall. Mountains will move every chain of the past You've broken into over fear, over lies We're singing the truth that nothing is impossible with you
the mountains will move every chain of the past you've broken into over fear over lies we're singing the truth impossible every giant Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time together this morning, Lord. We just thank you for your forgiveness. We just thank you that we can be restored by you, Lord. Just help us as we go about this week, Lord. Help us to share that great commission, Lord, of our of our experiences with you with others. We pray you'll be with us now. We ask all these things in your name's sake. Amen.